All right, so cold open uh, fodder. This is Germany in the 16th century, and it looks like something that might be Star Wars. Do we really want to talk about Star Wars no, again on this I podcast? I haven't seen. I haven't seen. A, I haven't seen the last two Star Wars. I no, um, me I, either. I haven't watched an Obi. This is how far behind on TV I am. I'm watching Arcane still. I never saw that because it was about a video game I not played. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so. I, 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 this, this is, this is something I got to tell you. So it's a video, it's a TV show at a, a late Netflix original, which is already like, okay, okay I'm, I'm skeptical. Um, sure. Adaptation of a free to play video game that mm. um, has notoriously toxic culture. And furthermore, if you were to tell somebody that this is who has played said game, that this is a, a show that takes place in the world of that game, the first thing they would say is that they're surprised that the game has a story. This is Le- it's League of Legends. Yeah, is yeah, that yeah. Right, and the, okay. the opening theme is by the most mid musical artist on earth, uh, which is Imagine Dragons. Oh, I was gonna say Coldplay, but yeah, same. Imagine same Dragons vibe. is Coldplay of the 2010s, so <laughs> they just extraordinarily mid band that makes uh-huh. very passable music. Yeah. Um, but uh, so the, the theme songs by Imagine Dragons, and then so and then it's yeah, based on all those things, and despite all of that. It's really good. I've heard it's, it's good. It's really good. And I'm like, how am I so into this show? Which is essentially um, the main thing is like the origin story of uh, what I'm only picking up is if Joker was a girl boss. Oh, OK. But also it was class politics at the same time. Wow. And it's about steampunk and high magic. And so like it's just like all those things at the same time. It's all the things that you love. You love Joker. You love girl bossing. Mm-hmm. You love class struggles you actually lo- like you love cla- a good class struggle i do and i actually okay this is something where i know we disagree and i know that this is going to um this is a Uh-oh. hot issue but yeah. i actually kind of liked Uh-oh. the the clown movie with joaquin phoenix <laughs> I, okay so it's not that i did not like the clown movie okay it's it's that i don't think it was as brilliant as some people say it is I mean, it's, I think, it's taxi cab with um with 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 dc comics i think it's i think that i think there are definitely parts where it falls for it falls flat but i've i've only also seen it once so yeah. yeah the other thing too is when it comes to um it hit something that i think was very big in movies that i am very very tired of which is um i think this is like a disney created thing which is that we we've kind of this conclusion that all protagonists have to be good people that we emulate. And if they are bad people, then we have to think that they are, that this is a bad, this is a bad movie because right. uh, every protagonist has to be a heroic, like person that should be emulated. And it's like, you can't have a movie about a person who is not a good person. <laughs> like say the like Joker. Say the Joker. <laughs> one, one of, yeah. one of history's most famously bad people. Yeah. And so, and, and that, that, that part when I, when I, a lot of the backlash against that movie against a sad clown movie I felt like was that MCU imposed like archetype put on society uh, channeled mm. through this movie that was trying to do something a little bit a little bit more complicated than here are the good guys and the bad guys and a lot of people were like no this is too much can't do it wait hold on hold on hold on what, j- are you saying we live in a society Tristan we do and um, much like a society there is a society of people listening to us talk about movies when we're supposed to be talking about podcast or alien stuff. We're supposed to be talking about alien stuff. Now that we've alienated our audience, uh, let's talk about some aliens. Hi, this is a podcast called It's Probably Not Aliens, where uh, we look at ancient astronaut theory, ancient aliens, the History Channel show, uh, other stuff in that realm, and we uh, debunk it usually. Would you say that's fair? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we debunk it as, we, we don't want to, we reluctantly debunk no. it every time. That's a good way of putting it. We reluctantly debunk it, and uh, uh, through 
through, you know, the lens of looking at interesting people and places and cultures and objects even uh, throughout history. Uh, I I don't do that. I just sort of am here to learn. My name is Scott. I know nothing. I'm Tristan Johnson, and I learn the things. I liked my description of myself as I'm the abyss looking back. That was a good one. Uh, yeah, I think I, that one will <laughs> that one definitely captures your essence. Yeah, uh, that's a good tagline. I should use that for my YouTube channel. Please buy Manscaped. I'm the abyss looking back, Tristan Johnson. Um, <laughs> you know, but no, but like I, I, I have had a lifelong obsession with conspiracy theories, especially their cultures and uh, UFOs and stuff like that, specifically like the anthropology of the people who study them. And uh, that has brought us to this podcast that we're now listening to. That's like, what, 43, 44 episodes deep now? Something like that i believe this is episode 43 and uh we get worse and worse at at the intros as we (laughs) go on so thank you for listening to us talk about movies a topic that we're both incredibly knowledgeable about (laughs) especially me what Um, are we talking about today tristan oh boy okay so this is a fun one i decided that we need some fun um we do we we've done i'm like right now we're the the epic of um like as we're recording this we just had the uh brahma weapons episode come out and Mm -hmm. like before that we went through like the i would say pretty down note uh episodes of the the duo episodes about friggin um david ike yeah david ike and then before that we had eric von daniken and i was like okay maybe we this one this one is uh, a little bit of science a little bit of goofiness and is probably one of the funnier ones that i've come across um because as i'm watching the new episode and by the new episode i mean like i think like i'm into episode three or four of the show at this point (laughs) um we um this one's all about close encounters and we're going to be kind of covering close encounters or evidence of alien visitations uh as part of the story here and this one is um part of a kind of litany of interesting ones from european history that i'm very interested in digging into which is basically hey we found this weird thing from the middle ages or from the early modern period and we think that this is an alien and this one was one i had never heard of and when i saw the picture that really sells it I was like okay I gotta figure out what this is I need to know right now and yeah. it's something called the the Nuremberg Space Battle of April 4th 1561 whoa okay so all the way back in the 1500s there apparently was some sort of space battle and yeah. people were documenting it from Earth yeah space had not been invented yet but uh, apparently no th- it was co- all us. We, it was just us yeah there was t- nothing beyond the sky. Yeah, they hadn't invented it yet uh, no. until um, David Hatfield invented space in 1996, I want to say. Honestly, that's pretty top tier invention. Yeah, it's a Canadian invention. Humanity. Canadian invented space. Okay, well, you don't have to like tie your own country. You don't. It's it's for everybody, Tristan. Fair, fair. Okay, so, space is for everyone, not just Canada. Uh-huh. <laughs> that's a t-shirt. Um, <laughs> okay, so the idea was that there's this very interesting, wacky story that comes out of a broadsheet, which is sort of like a older, shorter version of a newspaper from the 16th century, um, specifically from Nuremberg, the, the city in modern day Germany. And essentially, it is this extremely wacky cut that appears to show a battle happening in space. Now, Scott, I've shared you the notes of this, and I'm sure that this yes. will end up on Twitter at some point. But um, would you like to describe the absolute wackiness of this um, this wood carving? Yeah, I absolutely would, Tristan. Uh, right after I right click and save to download so I can tweet it out later. If this was an NFT, guess what, Tristan? I got it. You can't stop me. All my broadsheets gone. Mm -hmm. So this image, it's the very top one, right? I mean, it's so wacky. This image is, it looks like, all right. So if I'm describing it from the bottom up, right? Mm -hmm. Pretty normal, this bottom, right? And in the bottom left-hand corner, we've sort of got this like nice city in in the distance. Uh, And then towards the, uh, the bottom right, we have a more field that's more in the foreground. 
around with some stuff on fire and some people freaking out a little bit. But then uh, th- th- that only takes up maybe like one sixth of of this image. The top five sixths look like uh, just, <laughs> just the wackiest looking like polka dot art. It's like polka dots. There's like the sun that it looks totally non plus. Like this sun is just like, well, it's a living, you know, like that <laughs> sort of thing. Um, there's all sorts of weird geometric shapes. There's like uh, X and uh, like little curves and lines that are also have polka dots on them. There's also this big black, it almost looks like an arrowhead sort of a thing uh, that that's that's taking up a lot of space. It just looks like a scatter shot of random shapes and colors. Mm-hmm. Is exactly. that, would you say I'm about accurate? Yes. So basically the way that this was described in uh, an old thing is that there was a battle of spaceships over the city of Nuremberg, including one that crashed the ground in 1561. Oh, is that, the, is that yeah. the fiery? Okay, the fiery stuff in the foreground. All right. Mm-hmm. Even in the writing, like in the contemporary writing, they wrote that these objects showed up in the sky that started battling with each other and jousting, I think, is one of the ways they described it. Uh. Oh, that would explain like the pointy shapes and, mm-hmm. and things. Okay. So like, that's basically like, okay, what? Um, Nuremberg had a, a space battle over it. Like something from like Star Wars or something happened in. Uh... Yeah. And people documented it and it, it looks absolutely wacky. Yeah. And before like any like major sources of doubt come through, this is a verified like artifact. Like this broadsheet definitely exists. And as far mm-hmm. as we can tell, he probably, probably wasn't lying um, or at least wasn't like didn't think he was lying and uh, that that something did happen right. in the skies over Nuremberg uh, that is depicted in artistic form in this thing. That is absolutely wild. Give me one second. I want to turn off my fan really quickly just so there's less noise. He's just in the background being like, I love your work. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up, fan. I'm recording. I'm just kidding. I'm nice to all my fans. See, VidCon's happening right now, so he hasn't been able to meet any of his fans, so he turned it on so that he could like bask in the... I'm back now. Were you saying something about me? No, no, no. Okay. You, sh- you kind of stopped really like in the middle of the <laughs> sentence when I got back. Are you sure yeah. it wasn't anything? No, no, no. It's it- fine. Okay. I-, I trust you. Um... <laughs> Okay, so let, let's talk about this. Let's talk about this uh, this this fantastic piece of art. Yeah. So the guy that was made by a guy by the name of Hans Glaser, who um, was a real person who really did make woodcuts, and this is actually from that period. Cool. It's depicting a real event that people saw. So I want to make that all very much like it's not. This is not a hoax. This is not like a hallucination or anything yeah, like that. It's not a fake thing that someone made on Dolly or anything like that. No. This is a real piece of a, a real piece of art. Yeah. By the way, I am still obsessed with Dolly drawings. They are amazing. I just saw they're still, they're fantastic. Uh, Spider-Man in ancient Egypt and it is amazing. <laughs> um, this is how, this is how conspiracies are going to spread. Now people are going to take like, you know, Egyptian hieroglyphs, but, th- but the Hulk is there. And then people will be like, how do you explain this one? Hmm? Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. There's Dolly mini, which is the one that people are making the memes with, but then there's like the actual Dolly. Uh, yeah. And some, only some people who are like basically like computer science researchers, researchers or AI researchers are able to access that one because it's a uh, seriously computationally heavy. So like it yeah. takes like a huge amount of, you have to like book computer time to use it. Um, but, uh, but, um, but it creates some extreme results fa- are good. Yeah. Yeah. And so like it, like we're never going to be able to trust a single piece of digital media ever again, very soon. No. Um, anyways, back in the 1500th hundreds. Uh, so this is what's called a broadsheet. I mentioned this before. It's sort of like an early beta version of newspapers. Um, but oh. one of the ways that I looked up when I was sort of reading about this description is that they're actually based on like journalistic standards and things like that. And based on like the kinds of things they covered, it would be more accurate to say that they were a predecessor for something like the Enquirer oh. um, because they focused on stories of the weird stories of the violent. And there wasn't they didn't have that much problem with like stretching the truth yeah the like uh like the national exaggerator in a pup yeah. named scooby-doo precisely 
Um, and so like about, so, so yeah, like when, uh, when you look at like broad sheets throughout this period, you'll notice that there are a lot of writings about astronomical phenomenon, things like the Aurora Borealis. Um, and they're usually interpreted in the text as being a sign from God because, you know, signs from God, people were very into signs from God well, in 16th were century super Europe. into God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's wild. They were just crazy about God. Everybody, they were super, yeah. imagine, imagine a continent where everybody is your Sunday school teacher. It was oh, just, just long just hair that guy. and acoustic guitars all over the pro, all over the continent. There are only chairs that you can sit in backwards. Like yep. you can't sit in them forwards. Mm -hmm. It's a fun time. And just all the time, like you know, there's one person who didn't collect their taxes. And his name he just pulls up the acoustic guitar. <laughs> um, <laughs> Wait, so, <laughs> that's just why I assume I've never been to church, so I don't know. I, I, that's just my assumption of Sunday school teacher. Mm -hmm. I'm just here to guess about pretty, God. Gab about God. Let's what's happening here. So so I'm going to I'm going to like not clickbait this. So here's what it likely is. And um, we'll go into a whole thing trying to describing it. It's something called a sun dog, a, um, su a sun dog. Yes. So if you were okay. to scroll down to the second picture, you might see a picture of what's called a sun dog. If you want to oh. Google image search, there's tons of pictures of these things. I, I will describe it in the best way that I can. It looks like a lens flare. Kind of does. So what it is, is um, basically if the Earth's atmosphere um, or ice in the sky is up there and it hits the light of the sun in a specific way, it sort of acts like a prism and it mm -hmm. reflects the light, making uh, light from the sun and moon do wacky and weird things. It's like a real life lens flare. Yeah, essentially. And Nuremberg had uh, at that time had very good conditions for something like a sun dog. And when uh, there is other examples going way, way back of people seeing what are essentially essentially sun dogs and thinking that they are um, having some kind of religious significance. So this is not why, without precedent. Why are they called sun dogs? They don't look like a dog. That's a good question. I got to always remember, like, you always want to know the origin of the name of the thing. I, I, I do. I, I, I never, I'm I never sorry. look it up and I should. Etymology. Etymology. It's yeah. my favorite. Um, here's what the, here's what um, the obscure uh, website Wikipedia says, mm -hmm. um, which that the exact etymology of sundog largely remains a mystery. <laughs> oh, fantastic. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, it is, quote, of obscure origin. <laughs> Someone just said it one day and everyone was like, yeah, close enough. We'll just go with it. So the, the best got thing they can go for is that dog uh, in the past in English used to be a uh, verb as well as a noun, which meant to chase something. So it's like a thing that chases the sun. Okay. It kind of looks like eh, it kind of looks like that like the sun is it almost looks like the sun's being flanked on either side less mm -hmm. less chasing more surrounding yeah well i'm also looking at it and they have about three other explanations that say it might come from norse mythology or from ancient greek or from uh anglo cornish so yeah well it was supposed to put rested on on on, on the dog thing so yeah well, you know i think you know th just based on this picture it's like three three sort of bright lights and so if you want to connect it to to dogs, you can be like, yeah, it's like like a Cerberus, like mm -hmm. with three heads, a sun, a sun with three heads. That's something. I'm trying. I'm just trying my best here. Yeah, man, it works. Um, so the first sun dog sighting uh, that's been, is actually depicted in a famous painting, which is called uh, Vader Solstavlan. That was amazing. Uh, Vader, well Vader Solstavlan. I have a feeling this is Swedish, and uh, Mia Mulder is going to uh, <laughs> hurt me. Yeah, it's it's a it's an optical phenomenon that was seen over uh, Stockholm in 1535. So. I am right. Uh, and basically it was this painting that showed that or this uh, this stellar event that uh, it was interpreted as uh, an omen of God's forthcoming revenge on King Gustav Vasa because he okay. brought he did the ultimate crime of bringing Protestantism to Sweden. Oh, can't do that. Yeah, we're in the 1500s. There's a lot of like Protestants and Catholics like I still don't know. And like I grew up like in the church. I still don't really know what the difference between all the all the different things are all the different denominations are well i mean uh, i don't want to do a podcast within a podcast but basically uh, around the time of this exact uh painting a guy named martin luther basically did not like a lot of the things the catholic church was doing specifically like um the fact that they were doing this thing where they were selling indulgences which is that you could uh donate money to the church and in term you could get like a get out of sin free card basically oh that's handy yeah um because like the catholic church had gotten to a point where they had very like um bureaucratized the whole idea of like sin and forgiveness and all that kind of stuff into a, a very neat system. 
But Martin Luther didn't like that. And he wrote 99 things that he didn't like about the church. And he stapled on onto a church uh, door. And uh, long story short, he became uh, he sort of broke off from the Catholic Church and made his own Christian sect. And a bunch of other people who were kind of sick of the, the Pope having so much power joined in because they either wanted to get divorced in the case of King Henry VIII and like a bunch of other people. Uh, and they basically all broke off and made their own sort of sects. And then because it's Protestantism, there was no like leader per se. There's no overarching church. They broke into a million different sects. And now, you know, there's like a, a billion uh, Protestant denominations. But one thing that it did lead to was uh, a violent period of religious strife in Europe, mm. um, especially in Germany. Gotcha. Where Germany was uh, one kind of country called the Holy Roman Empire, but it was made up of like various semi-independent principalities that um, took various different sides uh, when it came to embracing Protestantism. So things got super complicated and violent very fast. Sounds like it. I'm so, I feel like I, I brought us down a, a very long rabbit hole of religious studies. That's okay, that's okay because this is like, even though it's not talked about in this, it's kind of like, why would they, why would they make such a big deal about this? Because this is, uh, this came out in a period of extreme religious turmoil in a place where that was like at the epicenter of this religious turmoil. So it's mm. intri- it's it's useful contextual knowledge. And we all know how you feel about context. I do love context. Mm-hmm. I have a t-shirt that says so. Yeah. I got the last one, I think. I think you did, yeah. Um. So there's a lot of these uh, these woodcuts that uh, depict sundogs and they're interpreted to be messages from God often because if you look at the thing you can kind of see a cross in the center of the sun. Oh, I see it. Yeah. And so sundogs are often interpreted to be God telling people to do things. What specifically? What kind of message do you get from that? From seeing a big sort of ball of light in the sky that sort of has a cross in it. Like what does that tell you? You, Tristan, if you saw that what does that tell you? My guess is that (laughs) my guess is that it's either telling me uh, that the thing that I want to do has divine approval or that God is mad at me for the thing that I just did. Those are the two Ah, ways that I would interpret it. Dang. Could go either way. Could go either way. Turns out that these symbols are ambiguous. Apparently in the case of the Nuremberg one, uh, the way that they interpreted that polka dot mess was that they should go to war with the Turks. Oh, (laughs) was that a thing that they wanted to do anyway? Um, They could try. That was a period when the Ottoman Empire was very powerful, but, um, you know, you're welcome to try. You're welcome to try. The Sultan might put up a fight, I'm just going to say. So the big, so the first image we talked about with all the polka dots, that was a message saying, good luck, go try. Yeah. Okay. Do it. Now you have divine, you have, you do divine permission to go and try uh, to, uh, to mess with uh, Constantinople and not think that they're going to just utterly destroy you. But that's, 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 that's neither here nor there. Um, so th- these things are sun dogs, but like, I guess my question is like, I've never seen one. How do they, how do they happen? What does, what does it mean? What, what, like, I, I don't know. Like how, how common is something like this? I don't know. I have lots of questions about sun dogs. They're, they're fairly rare phenomenon. They're more likely in places where it's very cold and in places where there is like ice in the air. Like, uh, I think they're much more common up in the Arctic, but, uh, they can be seen on cold days and they can be seen seen even on non cold days just really depends upon um, it's a cloud thing. If you have clouds that are very high up in the atmosphere to the point where the water is crystallized, it can those crystals can basically turn into a little prism. It's sort of like the same, not the same conditions, but the similar type of thing going on when you have a rainbow. Gotcha. So rainbow is more likely to happen because there's it's when all the sort of mist from the rain in the air refracts the sunlight. And that's why it's a rainbow because it refracts all the white light. But um, but a sun dog is sort of doing that. But it's like the clouds are refracting uh, sunlight in weird and funky ways. I do. So but do people use these a lot to make some sort of weird, strange claims about aliens then? I, I would say so. Yes. But um, in this case, uh, I think that the, the, the really good question to talk about is just how like how do you get from that picture that looks like, you know, maybe like a cross, maybe like a circle, maybe some like funky stuff to polka dot zaniness. Um, yeah. It's going to take a little bit that? of unpack. <laughs> okay, how do we get from that to that? Well, we will find out right after this. Right after this. Did 
Did you know that I'm going to go talk about a movie again? Did you know that the next uh, Spider Verse movie, the animated one, I, I think the villain is going to be a, a, a villain named Spot, Ooh. which is an un, unsung Spider Man villain. So I'm excited about that. Do you think the the weird zany polka dot sun dog thing is going to play into Spider Man lore in any way? Do these sun dogs? Uh, are they holes to other dimensions? Well, actually, what it was, uh, was uh, what that woodcut depicted was a battle between that villain and the um, the other guy from the James Gunn uh, Suicide Squad movie. Oh, Polka Dot Man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a DC Marvel crossover event. It was Spot versus Polka Dot Man. It was <laughs> just circles flying everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> precisely <laughs> bright colors it was a good time it was i mean it wasn't a great time because one of them did die and that is and i don't want to spoil it for anybody so just go read up on your uh 15th century history and you'll find out mm-hmm. or i guess i guess that would be 16th century history right yeah, I don't know and then anything. you'll find out which one won dc or marvel um <laughs> well, okay um so th- so basically the first one that has to come to mind that is very strange is that they did mention that some of the orbs were different colors um, so one of the quotes I got here is that first the sun showed and was seen with two blood colored half round strokes like the diminishing moon right through the sun and the sun above under and on both sides stood blood colored and partly bluish or iron colored also black colored round orbs. So a lot of colors, a lot of different colors. It mm-hmm. seems. Yeah. Uh, my, my, uh, my sun dog of many colors. So <laughs> I found out that you actually can, um, like get multiple colors in a sun dog. And I have a picture here of a sun dog that actually has both a halo and a little red orb that it made. Yeah, I see that. It's sort of off to the side. It's uh, yeah, just like a little red ball. That's so weird. Mm -hmm. And so this is just an example of one. It could be that there was a time that there were multiple ones or that it might have looked like different colors from different points of view. Yeah, things like that. Interesting. And so that would be all the different polka dots that we saw in that image is all these different colored little circles. Yeah, because if you think think about that as like a little refraction coming through that is part of the visible light spectrum that is red, then you could imagine that if there was a whole like big like cloud refracting all sorts of lights, it might come through as like a whole rainbow of different colors. Yeah. Theoretically. Theoretically. The, at the end of the day, like um, what we are still talking about is a very spectacular version of a very rare st- uh, phenomenon, but we have seen cool and rare versions of that with photography. So it's not like it's something that has never been seen before. Yeah, um, we've there are photographs of it and I'm going to go ahead and write click save as once again thank you very much the only podcast episode that's going to have slides (laughs) Mm -hmm. next slide please um okay so the next thing we got here is the next little bit it says um the same on both sides in circled plates around the sun there were such blood colored and the other orbs this is translated from german so mm, you know um in great numbers standing three in a row, sometimes four in a quadruple, and also as singles. And between such orbs, a lot of blood-colored crosses have been seen, and between such crosses and orbs were blood-colored strips. Thick behind, um, and the front a bit smoother then. So like, and then things are a little bit messy and don't really have a good translation. Yeah, I'm but, seeing um, that. But basically what these could refer to are what are called halos. And uh, I'm going to show you a picture of some really wild sun dogs, and you can see Whoa. Uh, sort of comparisons that people have made where people People have shown examples of like those wood carvings I told you about sun dogs uh, in the past versus like photographs of real ones. And you can see all of a sudden where things can get really wacky very fast. Yeah. Okay. So it looks like there's some, even some upside down rainbows at certain points. The images as a whole almost looks like a big eye, like a human eye sort of looking at you with like uh, eyelids and, and things like that. There's all sorts of different arcs and curves and lines intersecting with other lines, which would create those like crosses and things that we saw in the original image. Mm-hmm. All sorts of different concentric sort of circles on circles and circles intersecting and crossing along with each other. This is cool. You know I'm going to right-click save as. Yeah. Uh, and you can imagine if you lived in a pre-scientific, extremely religious Christian society, especially one in a period of religious strife, that you see this and you could 
easily see this as interpreted as a sign from God. Oh my God. It looks like a gigantic eyeball staring at me. Yeah, for real. And if I know anything about biblically accurate, like angels, this is just one of many, many eyeballs that that the angel will have. (laughs) Saying not, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Okay, I'll try. (laughs) (laughs) So you can you can see on there that there are things you can easily interpret as uh, tube or rod like. Um, Mm -hmm. There are shapes you can definitely see as like the curves and rods. Um, And yeah, you could actually have like broken up halos, which could be the the sort of uh, the rods that were mentioned in the Nuremberg thing. Yes. So all of that is all that is is doable looking at this Uh, second. So the next quote we got here is mixed in uh, between together with others stood two big tubes, one uh, to the right and the other to the left in those little and big tubes were three, four and more orbs. So um, the this is the other thing where there's probably some artistic license being taken where they're talking about hands and stuff like that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the sun has a face on it in the carving. So that is true. It doesn't look too happy about having a face, though. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um, so, yeah, this all together began to fight. The orbs first in the sun moved around the ones uh, standing on both sides. So the ones which were outside moved together with the orbs out of the small and large tubes into the sun. Also, the tubes moved towards each other like the orbs and everything fought and battled uh the german term is uh gestritten und gefuschten with each of them nearly one hour long and after the battle which moved uh moved for a while into and again out of the sun from one uh side to the other most violently exhausted itself by each other so this is the part where they're talking about there being a space battle yeah they're, they're very specifically using language of things fought and they battled and there was a fight so, I mean, yeah, if it's if it's trying to be literal, then I, I, I get it. But it also just sort of sounds like poetic language to me, like yeah. the way that, you know, the way that Tolkien might say, like, you know, the sun slashed red across the sky or something like that, where it's like it's just like a nice poetic way of like getting the tone across and the mm-hmm. vibe across. I'm actually reading Return of the King right now, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling this vibe. And uh, to my son, uh, every day we're reading a little bit of the Silmarillion, so I am deep <laughs> in Tolkien right now. You're, to your newborn baby? <laughs> He's not new. He's almost six months new, old. All right. But, so um, your six month old baby you're reading. But like he doesn't yeah. like the thing is like he doesn't need like he doesn't know any words. So no, they just want to hear like the cadence and to hear more words. And I'm like, well, you're not going to hear any more words than when you're finding out about Fingolfin and Fingelfin uh, fighting Morgoth on the girdle of Maedros or whatever. So like, go for it. That's fair. That's fair. I didn't know you could just say anything to babies and it would be helpful. Well, you're not supposed to do baby talk. You're supposed to use real language. But the thing, but you real language, you say. Listen, there's a lot of there's a lot of new proper nouns, but there's still like you know words like uh huh. Like I know that he's heard probably the word girdle earlier than most babies have. Probably because in the Silmarillion, uh, this elf king makes a force field around his kingdom that they call a girdle. Well, there you go. And now it's gonna be now it's gonna be your baby's first word. Yep, girdle. Oh God. Um. So what's going on with these shapes fighting? The th- so here's the main thing that does stick out. So as you kind of mentioned, they're not like it does have some poetic. Li- it does seem like there's some poetic license going on, mostly because uh, there's not a lot of detail about what like the fighting actually was. Like if we were talking about swords clashing or anything like that, or more likely if we had seen lasers or light flashes, or is this just a description yeah. of maybe saying that they just chased and ran into each other? Yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, there, it doesn't really say anything specific about the fighting. Because what fighting could be defined as and this is a thing that does happen with sun dogs is that th- as the sun moves the shapes would change and move around oh. and would appear to push other ones out of the way yeah I see. So there's almost like a dance there or a fight, some would say. And so that like explains a couple things, but there's still a few things that are unexplained. Like for one, they describe a big black spear and also uh, that one of them crashed. Yeah, that's true. The big black spear takes up a a nice big part of that image. 
crash and yeah we have a fiery crash what's that about so let's start so first of all there's a lot of questions that have to do with the crash for, uh that would stick out that would be probably uh important to note that if there was an actual alien spaceship ufo crash um there would be wreckage um there would be bodies uh-huh. uh and how come and if that if there was wreckage and bodies how come there's nothing in the woodcut that shows like anything that they found at the crash site um yeah. and also that there's no like uh an alien spaceship crashing in nuremberg uh would have been way bigger than just one broadsheet story like it would have been all over the place mm. so why is there not like everything all over the history books of something like this plus also how would they not have been able to start reverse engineering these ships and we would be like super technologically advanced uh, that's um, true and or things like you know that they would be all over the place like there'd be like monuments or anything depicting of that but really like there's just this one mention on this one wood cut and i have a feeling that if there was like a real crash then there would have been a little bit more and we already tristan. talked about how these broadsheets had a tendency to exaggerate oh tristan 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 you know it's a government cover-up oh man this one goes way back it goes way back they're covering it up it's just like area 51 and roswell and things like that they don't want you to know the truth oh it was nothing it was just a weather balloon they're gonna say all the way back in the 1500s but i know the truth tristan and i will not be silenced anymore i have a podcast it's impossible for me to be silenced i can say whatever i want i'm a white man with a podcast i can say whatever i want and people will take me seriously microphone and therefore all of my thoughts need to be on the internet yep um so so i was looking into like what this could be and one of the explanations that was given to me was something called a fall streak which is actually uh fall streaks are a sort of cloud phenomenon that happens in cirrus clouds which is the exact which are clouds made up of ice crystals and as i mentioned that uh, ice crystals oh. are exactly the kind of thing that creates sun dogs you did say that i recall you saying that yeah so uh and next i got here is a picture of a uh of a fall streak mm-hmm. oh yes Oh, okay. Let me describe this one using using my my words, using my big boy words. So using your thought fossils. Using my thought fossils. So, the, imagine if the sky was covered in a very thin, even layer of clouds. Right, the whole thing, sort of thin, even layer of clouds, and then at certain points, it looks like something. Poof, sort of like fell through the clouds and created these like cloud streaks that are pointing downwards towards the earth, like little cones, little little ice cream cones uh, that point downwards towards the earth and they leave a little hole in their in their wake. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I'll explain to you how they're made. Uh, yeah, because it know. really d- it really does look like something just like fell through these clouds and, and, le- and left these trails as they made their way to earth. Mm-hmm. So have you ever like watched like those TikToks where you put uh, very pure water in the freezer and then you take it out and it's liquid, but then you just give it one smack. Oh, a little and whack. And it turns to ice. Yeah, because it got, it, it was past its freezing point but because but it, it needs something it needed something to like kickstart it into into freezing yeah because i ice crystals need something to crystallize onto it's mm-hmm. called ice nucleation and okay. what happens is that when you have these clouds you have uh pockets of water that are below freezing but because they have nothing to make ice crystals onto they can't nucleate and then when one does nucleate and turn to a crystal it creates this like domino effect mm-hmm. and uh that causes this like circle to sort of open up a hole in the cloud that looks almost like a perfect circle it does. and these crystals can be formed by like passing aircraft or um very other like natural things but uh these happen all the time and it's funny because when i looked it up also i learned that they are apparently uh some people believe that they are ufos <laughs> so we've come the full cl- circle wait the little cones themselves the ca- the cloud cones they think they are ufos more the holes like the the holes sometimes get mistaken for ufos that makes a little bit more sense but it would be a uf i mean just based on this one picture it it would yeah it would be a very blue ufo someone say sky blue (laughs) 
and they're they're also pretty rare. So are you s- rare enough that it would be worth me right clicking and saving as this possibly? Image? Yeah, yeah. All right, I'm gonna do that then. Um, this will make an epic Twitter thread when this episode comes out. I love that mm-hmm. I made a audio podcast with so many visual elements. <laughs> it helps me out, and it gives me something to do. I can I can describe images for people. There you go. You're our uh, you're our human eyeball. Yay! And I will put audio into your earballs. Um, so the the last part we could talk about is the black spear. Uh, The description of it was that after such events, uh, something like a black spear, a shaft from sunrise to the to the and the head towards sundawn has been seen with uh, big thickness and length, which is like, all right, big thickness and length. Interesting. But, Interesting um, word choice there. Yeah. But the thing is that if you look at the sun streaks, you could definitely uh, like this could be a bunch of things. It could be these like fall streak looks like those like cone things. But it also could uh, mm. like if you like if something if one of those was like in a shadow, it could look kind of dark. Uh, but it okay. also could be um, what's called a crepuscular ray, which is a sort of like oh. uh, trying to what a crepuscular ray is. I wrote that word down. I'm like, I'm going to remember what a crepuscular ray is. Well, crepuscular means like a- around like twilight or something like that. Because I love the word crepuscular. There are crepuscular animals. So there's sunbeams that originate when the sun is just below the horizon during twilight period. Yeah, I got it right. Look at me go. So there you go. You 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 taught me a word that I apparently wrote down thinking I would just remember, which like I can't even remember who starred in Stargate. So don't I shouldn't Mm -hmm. rely on my own memory for if there's anything that this podcast should teach everybody, especially (laughs) myself, is to never trust Tristan's memory. Hey, I got the thing about the movie The Nines wrong, where it wasn't pandas that control the weather, it's koalas. So I can see where you make a mistake. We're both bad at movie trivia. They're both very charismatic endangered species. Mm -hmm. Um, Now I'm going to find out that koalas are not endangered or whatever. They're just like, they're everywhere. They just just have chlamydia or something. We're not allowed to say anything on this podcast ever. What's it called? Russell Crowe has a chlamydia award for... uh, I do know that. I do know that uh, koalas... Koalas apparently are like have like an actual epidemic of chlamydia happening yes. to them and that they are um, because they evolved in a situation where they don't have that many predators and they just eat eucalyptus leaves that their brain has basically like just dissolved and their brain is extremely they're like they are possibly the most simple brain mammals on earth or something like that. That's incredible. Because and they're like, living it up to the point where their brain doesn't have any grooves. They have smooth brains, a smooth brained koala and they can control the weather, though. So yeah. think about that, that one. Mm-hmm. What really is all the weather control parts of the brain? That's the stuff that they use to fill in all the cracks. So, yeah. <laughs> Well, they're not bogged down by anything else, right? So they get to focus just on the weather. <laughs> they're just so, they're so like, they're vibing so hard that mm-hmm. they are able to control the weather. I get it. I love it. I love um, it. They're just, they're just vibing with the, uh, with the uh, Fresno Nightcrawler. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Best buds. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so like that, that, that's that's probably a false streak or a shadow or a light. So there's a lot of different things that it could have been given how many wacky phenomenon were happening. Yeah. Tons of things. So basically it's like really important to know that, uh, the whole UFO battle can be explained by natural phenomenon, very rare natural phenomenon, but they are all kind of connected in interesting ways. And like, it's not like, it's not impossible. You, 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 you get something really wacky, like a really cool sun dog and you mix it with, uh, a bit of artistic license and not a whole lot of journalistic ethics and you end up with this battle story. I mean, it's a cool story too. So Yeah. The other thing too is that you have to also think about the picture because the picture is not a photograph, right? Like the photo, like, and we, we, we want to think of it as, as that, but it isn't. It's a, it's a artistic rendering, which yeah. is important to note because basically, because there's only one page to show this, this isn't a comic book. Comic books hadn't been invented yet. Those were invented by, uh, Stan Schuster. Um, yeah, Stan Schuster. Stan Schuster and Simon Lee made made the first comic book. They did it. They invented Spawn, the first comic book superhero, Spawn. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. why, because he spawned all the other superheroes. He spawned all the other ones. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> 
So the thing is that Hans Glaser was depicting everything that happened over a period of what seemed to be about an hour on one page, which means that he put oh. everything that showed up in a single uh, drawing. And that's so why it didn't. It probably didn't all happen at one instance. That's why there's tons of these little circles and tons of these lines and all these different uh, shapes as he was just being like, and now there's this one and now there's this one, you know? Yeah. And none of the things that none of the places that wanted to say that this was a UFO uh, really felt overly compelled to mention that fact. Mm. Um, also, the woodcut shows them all jumbled together and randomly strewn about. But the writing does not describe it this way. So there's like a, a the, the dis- discrepancy between how it's described in the writing of this broadsheet and the actual art itself, because it's described as having like a pattern, all sorts of stuff that's very much evocative of a sun dog. But then the art just randomly has these shapes all over the place. So that so that's an important aspect to kind of look at. And yeah, there's another aspect to also look at, which is the fact that um, a lot of people saw this event happen. Mm-hmm. But one person who did not see this happen was Hans Glosser, the person who made the woodcut. So he wasn't there? No, he was not a witness. He put together what he drew basically using uh, descriptions from other witnesses. Oh, and then like kind of combined them all together into one thing. Yeah. So, so this is really funny because this happens a lot in old art, like because there was a time before photography, there's a lot of times where there are artists who have to draw like say an animal, but they've never seen that animal in their life. Um, and so oh. there's like these like European, like Europeans trying to paint what like they think a camel looks like. And it's like the most confusing looking thing ever. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Because you couldn't just Google things to find out what they look like. Now, that makes me, and this is another rabbit hole we could go, go down, but that almost makes me feel like that's where a lot of other, like, beliefs in it, or not even just beliefs, but, like, mythological creatures come from, is, like, someone was trying to describe an alligator, and then through the artistic process, they created a dragon or something like oh, that. Oh, most definitely, yeah. Yeah. That's, like, probably almost all cryptids. Yeah, <laughs> Probably, except for the ones we have on camera, like Bigfoot, which is real. Yeah, and the only cryptid that I believe in, the Fresno Nightcrawler. That's the one. So, yeah, so that's like, so basically he was just throwing things all randomly together and had no personal experience, like no memories of what he had. So what we have basically is a police sketch. And Uh, I don't know if you know anything about police sketches, but they are like notorious for being bad. (laughs) Um, Yeah. um, One famous example would be the Unabomber. Um, The Unabomber had a very famous police sketch. And what was very notable about it was that the guy looked absolutely nothing like it. Yeah. Well, yeah. And that's a hard one because I think you're exactly right. It's someone describing to someone else what something looked like. And so it's already going through multiple different like, you know, changes from one person to another visually, especially if they're working off of a memory. It's yeah, it's it, there's no way that it could be 100 percent accurate mm-hmm. and it's probably not even close. The other thing that's also interesting to point out is that um, this is not the only depiction of a battle happening in the sky done by the same guy. Oh, he was a his, he was a, he was a fan. He was doing this. This is his whole hobby now. He was also, just doing it all the time. Well, the thing is that like this is a way people described a lot of natural events. Like, um, for example, there were a lot. There's a lot of reports in the time of seeing things like knights who fight each other in the sky at night. Um, Oh, like little ja- that's like the little javelins. Yeah, uh, nobody says that these are aliens. They're probably another natural event. Um, okay, most well, likely we can start. We can yeah. start. We can, well, do- yeah. we can start now. But this is most likely them describing um, the Northern Lights. Aurora Borealis. Oh, okay. Um, and then Glasser embellished that witness to say that it was knights fighting in the sky. Mm. And um, and of course, there was also a pretty big uh, urge societally to attach some sort of divine or religious significance to these things. Right. Because, uh, which sort of created like a bit of a pareidolia effect because people were seeing uh, Jesus in sky toast, basically. Uh. <laughs> Yeah, so they 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 wanted it to be there. So they were taking really anything, anything they they could see, and they were just like, I don't know, that's probably God. 
Yeah. Um, so how did this happen? How is it that like some, you know, not like some rare, but normal weather events can like capture people's attention to get to the printed news and be a sign of God and be big enough of a thing that 500 years later, we're making a podcast about it. So this is this has to do with the sort of nature of media. And I think this is an important thing to mention, which is that uh, the media did in the past, as it does today, uh, has one goal, which is not to tell stories or to tell the truth truth, but to uh, get high on that sweet, sweet cashish. Yeah, baby. Let's roll it. Rake in that dough. Bring it on in. Yeah. So broadsheet makers, much like news people today, are, mo- are, are their primary focus is to make money. They are an advertising company that uses news to attract people to their platform. Um, much like you and I, uh, for a living, sell products over our podcast, hopefully, or our YouTube channels <laughs> in exchange for, right. uh, and, and we use content, the thing that we think that we are actually providing to bring people to look at the thing that we're actually getting the money for. <laughs> I mean, and that's like an unavoidable part of our, our society that we live in this, we live in this society and it, yeah. it makes you think Tristan, doesn't it? It makes you think about society. Mm-hmm. And these kinds of things are going to shape the way that you make things. Um, I know that Scott and I had a big conversation about how I am doing a lot of things that are making it so that I do not get to make a lot of money with my content. But that's a different story. Um, so the thing is, though, uh, and this happens on YouTube as well as in the news and very much in the past, which is that sensational stories are always the thing that get the eyeballs. And yeah. if you can't find a story that's sensational, there are ways to make it sensational. Uh, so this might be 16th century clickbait. That's a good way of putting it because the big black spear is like an arrow, right? Yep. You always have to have an arrow pointing at something. There's all sorts. Of, it's very colorful, very vibrant. 16 things drama. that show up in the sky over Nuremberg. Yeah, you will not believe dr- number seven. It's got drama. It's got intrigue. There's, you know, there's a fire. What's happening? The sun is there making a YouTuber face like and it's all it's, the it's, sun is there making a youtuber face <laughs> now i just want like a like an instagram account or something that's called sun reacts and it's just like good carvings <laughs> of the sun reacting to just, various things uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. um i can't visually describe the sun any more than just the sound effect of uh-huh. <laughs> Like, that's what it's doing. Oh, my God. Okay, sorry. I'm going to need, like, two seconds to process that one. Okay. (laughs) Um... So the other thing, too, is that so like, yeah, the more unbelievable the story is, the more people are going to want to know about it, which means to more sales, which means more broadsheets. And the and and also keep in mind that a lot of context had to be stripped out because these woodcuts were only one page, because at that time, the publishers thought that common people could really only manage one page or so, which like they were describing people in the 21st century, not the 16th. They they got it right. (laughs) They were ahead of their time. Um, And so I say that I say say that not as a judgment of others i say that as a person who that applies to yeah. like that applies to me uh but i also i also do have adhd so mm-hmm. i don't know how much that factors into it yeah so it does mean that if you only have one page to make your paper about that it better be good right you better like you know zhuzh it up as much as you can yeah it's got to catch the eye and as you also mentioned uh, or as we kind of talked about earlier that the reformation that kind of created the protestant church what had already happened, but it had only happened about 50 years ago. And in this place, the Catholic Church was probably still dealing and still had a lot of clout. But um, here's one of the things is that uh, the printer has to have a license, which um, could be helped by staying in the good graces of the Pope. Oh. So um, the basic like basically thinking about this, the society is fairly uneducated at this time, fairly uh-huh. superstitious. Of course. And in order order to keep printing you have to have a license that you might need the catholic church's approval on so you Um, might fill it with a lot of sensational signs from god you might want to try and keep your license by being like hey what do you think of this one what do you think of this one church do you like the do you like god do you like what i said about god being here and doing cool things 
God showed I up do. and he said that uh, Latin should stay the like language that we do our services in. God showed up and he said Latin is here to stay. <laughs> God showed up and apparently he wants us to invade the Ottoman Empire. I don't know what that's about, but uh, I don't know. Yeah. Was anyone thinking about doing that anyway? Because I feel like this is a this is an OK. This is a this is a thumbs up from God over here. Yeah, <laughs> there was a big rivalry going on because uh, actually we can even get into that. Christopher Columbus basically did his journey because they were looking uh, because like all of the roads to India, the Silk Road that kind of went to India and China had been shut down because the Ottoman Empire had risen to power and they were in control of all of those trade routes um, oh. because they basically, the Ottoman Empire basically controlled the entire Middle East at that point. And so they were looking for other ways to get to India and China to, you know, get all that sweet, sweet spice. Oh. So, so you got to sail around the earth. Well, yeah, they were funding different projects. Like some went to uh, the, the one that the first successful one went around the Horn of Africa. So they went down around South Africa and came up to went to India. But uh, Columbus was like, I have an idea. If we just I think that the earth is actually pear shaped and a lot smaller than it is in reality. So if we just sail west, we'll arrive in China. It'll be easy. And we're going to hit something eventually. Oh, I mean, he did. Oh, boy, did he. Um, so, yeah, like this, this, the Ottoman Empire was a big deal. So like, like that part makes sense. Yeah. But yeah, it's easy to see that like this was not a battle between alien spaceships, but probably weather events given greater significance because of a superstitious atmosphere, a media that's very biased and sensationalist and a public that, you know, loves to click on or do whatever, whatever it is that they do. What's what's the 16th century version of clicking on something? Um, reading outrageous stories. <laughs> so like you combine all that together and you end up with these wacky sensationalist stories, like, say, turning a couple weird weather events into a space battle. Well, the good news, Tristan, is I think... So much has changed since then, you know. I, I don't made think... a whole part about how the way Tristan makes you sad about how this shows that like media has always just been no, completely but awful. You, but you can't because that's not happening these days, you know. Clickbait. <sighs> That's a thing centuries ago. You know how people were clicking on everything centuries ago. Couldn't stop clicking on things. But, you know, uh, everything's fine now and no one would ever lie for money. Right? No, no one would ever lie for money. I can't think of several dozen people who would lie on the Internet. I can't do it. We're, we're all in a good Internet space now full of truth and happiness really mm -hmm. um so on that happy note um that's probably what this was another sign that humans are just awful at being truthful or accurate about anything ever that's true and if you liked this story if you liked all this fun stuff uh go go pet your sun dogs or cats and that's that's all i have to say about that Hey, thank you so much for listening to our show. Yeah, this was a this was a wild one. You know what's great about following Probs Not Aliens on Twitter is that you will get to see all of the images that I have right clicked save as. So mm -hmm. save as saved as right. I don't know. Saved as. Yeah, go follow us over there. Uh, and if you want to follow us individually, maybe you just maybe you only like one of us and you just want to hear what that one person has to say about other things. Maybe you only like one of us and you want to know what Scott has to think about things. Oh, don't say that. Tristan, where can people find you on the internet? I have a YouTube channel called Step Back where I make videos about um, the context and history behind things that are going on in the world. Um, and I'm getting increasingly unhinged as I like... <laughs> As I like, as like, you know, the world falls apart and I'm trying to explain it to everybody. Um, but if you, but if you want something that's, uh, more fun, if you want to learn about memes or why Amazon is uh -huh. bad, where should they go? Scottward. Yeah. Uh, you can go to my YouTube channel, NerdSync, N-E-R-D-S-Y-N-C. I make videos, uh, video essays, commentary videos nowadays. I'm, I'm dipping my toe into that space. Uh, and I've got a I've got a video about comic book memes coming out where I guarantee you no one could predict the last two minutes of the video. I guarantee it's going to throw everyone off guard. So look forward to that. Watch it soon, because as soon as the machine like what's it called, it's going to get uh, taken off of YouTube very fast. Yeah, it's going to be I do some pretty, pretty scandalous stuff in that. So yeah, you're you going to have to the, watch it. The unrated version is going up on Nebula. That's true. As soon as I post it to YouTube, you're gonna wanna you're gonna wanna right click save as you know what I mean? <laughs> like it's gonna be gone. Um 
if you like the show, you can write reviews. People have done that, and that's great. And it helps us out a lot. Uh, people five have done star. that, and that's great. And people have done that, and that is great. And we appreciate all the reviews, all the ratings. I know you can rate on Spotify. You can rate and review on Apple Podcasts. So thank you to everyone who's done that. And you can also just tell your tell your friends. Tell your friends about this show, right? Why haven't you done that yet? Tr- Tristan, how many friends have you told about our show? Literally everybody. I got my mom listening to this podcast. My, I got my, my mom's trying to figure out how to listen to podcasts. And as soon as she does, she will listen to this podcast. Excellent. Just yeah. Just keep telling your friends. Keep telling your friends about the show. Helps out a lot. Yeah. I, and of course, the other thing, too, is that um, unlike YouTube, we don't have a lot of recommendation algorithms that really uh, boost our show. The really the podcasts really only grow through word of mouth. And yes. uh, that is really like the way that uh, if you want to help out in any way whatsoever, the best thing that you can do is tell somebody about it. It. Yeah, send them over to probsnotaliens.com. That's the best place to send someone so that there's all of the different links and all of the different uh, ways you can listen to the show. Until next time, my name is Scott Nicewander. I'm Tristan Johnson, and the truth is out there. Probably. What do you think the click-through rate's going to be on this episode? What Should I do a clickbait title for it? 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 Do a clickbait title for it?